Welcome to Big Blend Radio with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazine.com. Welcome to Big Blend Radio with Nancy and Lisa. We're the crazy mother-daughter travel team and publishers of Big Blend Radio and TV Magazine and Parks and Travel Magazine. And today, Victoria Chick, the Silver City, New Mexico-based contemporary figurative artist and early 19th, 20th century print collector, is joining us to talk about 19th century art around the world and how travel and transportation change things. You know, just all these world events that happened that uh, connected artists and um, gave artists this global way of painting or a new way of painting. Well, it's a whole new world when you get to travel. I thought you were going to sing that. It's a whole new world. Oh, boy. I know, right? Uh, anyway, Victoria. <laughs> Way too early for that. <laughs> I know. Victoria, Victoria is on our shows every month, and uh, she's got articles in both magazines. If you go to blendradioandtv.com, you'll see her expert page there, and you can click on her, and then you can read her articles and listen to past interviews. And also, the most important thing is to go to her website, which is victoriachick.com. You can see her work, her prints, and uh, she's got articles on there, too. So she's got a lot going on. Hey, Miss Victoria, how are you? Oh, I'm just great, Lisa. I'm so happy to be with you today. Hey, we're happy to have you back on here and to talk. I know this article that you have is 19th century art around the world. It's interesting because you could you could have written a book on this. It's really fascinating. I, <laughs> I know I could have written a book. <laughs> I mean, it, it, there is so much material. There's so much material. It's so interesting. I, I really enjoyed writing this article. Yeah, this article, um, everyone, is up on nationalparktraveling.com, and it'll also be featured in the June-July issue of Parks and Travel magazine because this is interesting. We wouldn't think, oh, you know, this it connects with parks and travel, but it really does. And so this is really, you know, when you think about how every, other countries were taking over other countries, and, and it starts there, but also things like, you know, boats and and trains and and all of that that's really what started this this change of art it it was instrumental and you know we sort of think our our decade or our our century i should say has been has seen a lot of changes which it has but the 19th century saw incredible changes too because when it started out people were you know they were walking where they wanted to go or they were taking a horse or they're taking a horse and carriage uh, by the time the century ended, they had trains, automobiles were just beginning, and uh, they had were steamships. So there was the, the the expansion of their ability to travel and to see other things and to interact with other cultures just went exponential uh, during that century. Hmm. And you think now that we can hop on Google and look at any place we want. You know. <laughs> right. And now, you know, and now we're just uh, we're we experience these things in like a virtual reality. Uh, yeah. So I mean, well, but we're not really experiencing them uh, yeah. like they did. That you know, like we 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 would if we if we if we were normal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> like that. Well, you know, I think what's interesting about this too is that you know the the transportation came and all these changes happened. Um, but I just want to, I know we're going to talk about America too, because that really changed America. Um, and how right. art, you know, how artists came out here from different countries. And we've actually talked about it over the years with you. You know, there's a lot of French artists have come over, German artists. Um, so a lot of, you True. know, uh, people have come over, especially for the West. But yes. when we talk about changes, we also have to look at this is, you know, really instrumental of how our national parks were even founded mm -hmm. and created the national park system. The thought of protecting land and knowing about it and how the role of art played that. And it and it would it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the trains. That's true. That's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. Well, it wouldn't have happened in the 19th century anyway. But no. uh, but the fact that the trains were uh, chugging across the you know, the continent was was truly instrumental in getting the national parks started. Mm -hmm. It's cool. Everybody got to check that out. Um, and also, um, let's let's go to Europe because this is where it starts. Because England right. wanted everything, and so did France. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Yeah. Well, so in, in the 19th century, in, in the 19th century, England and France had about everything. You know, uh, between the, between those two countries, they controlled um, basically, uh, I would say, over half the world. They mm -hmm. they were uh, trade treating. They were um, they were colonizing. Um, they they were in control of vast parts of, of all other continents, mm. and uh, that influence. You know, we influence. We probably influence, or, or I should say, we the Western Western culture probably influenced those continents to a certain degree. But those continents had a big influence on Western culture too, especially mm. in the areas of art and mm. architecture, mm. Um, design. So mm -hmm. the, it was a two-way street. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine what it would be like right now? We're so used to film and books and paintings and everything. Like I knew what Africa pretty much was going to look like before I got there. But yes. Just imagine if you, when if you go to Africa like in the in <laughs> before before everybody else and you don't know what a lion is. <laughs> Yeah. Oopsie. Yeah. You know, you must have been astounded at everything. So, in a way, you know, we've been um, we've been educated, but a little of the excitement goes out the window. Then, it, just if you like go to Australia and you didn't realize that kangaroos hop and they, you know, yeah, was right. the first person to see that? Yeah. <laughs> well, now we have space. Do you think people are going to go to space and start painting it like that? But even then, we have images. <laughs> You if know. their tubes don't float away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah really. really. Yeah, that'd, that'd be fun. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Plain air, space air painting. <laughs> yeah. They may have to come up with some different medium to, to, yeah. uh, to, that would work in space. Yeah, really. Yeah. Laser light. Well, you know what's interesting you talk about in the article, you know, all these cultures get it, get to connect and it's not just the landscape. It's, looking at each other's art and that's what really i found really interesting was artists got to see other artists and that yes. is really where they started to connect and and kind of change add let's put add new techniques to their portfolio right i should say that not necessarily change their style but enhance that ha that ha things. yeah that happened over over a, a period of time you know when they when uh Colonization first started uh, in the early part of that century. I mean, I, of course, I mean the 19th century beginning was not the first time that that people from European countries went abroad, but mostly they were they were they were trading. This is this mm -hmm. is where they were actually going to the countries and living. They were setting up colonies there, and so um, it was a little bit different. But the first, and they wanted to send. Uh, examples of what they were seeing back to their their mother country, bring, uh, whether it be France or uh, England, uh, mm. Italy to a little bit of an extent, and also um, the Dutch to a certain extent. Uh, they would they would painters would go, but they would paint scenes in in a European style, in a, in the style that they were used to painting in, and they were showing something exotic and kind of, almost like a um, like a National Geographic picture, they were they were sending it mm -hmm. back, you know, uh, to show people what was going on in in these mm -hmm. in these places. As time uh, passed, they got more interested in seeing the design of the of the of the people whose country they were in, and how they worked, and what they used to paint with, or to or to create art with. Sometimes it was it was sculpture. Sometimes it was you know materials like like bark or uh, uh, they would do prints like the in a woodcut te technique. So there was a lot of um, interest by the by European artists in mm -hmm. how artists of other countries and other cultures actually worked, mm -hmm. and they they adopted a lot of techniques and a lot of ideas from those those other countries uh perspective is, is one of the ideas that they uh a kind of a change in perspective because we think of perspective as being rather linear or it has to be like atmospheric perspective but mm -hmm. like for example in 
uh, Japan, they were using uh, a tilted perspective, a kind of a bird's eye perspective, where they were looking down on uh, the subject that they were um, painting or making a wood, uh, print out of. And uh, so that so when they looked down on it, the things that were farthest away were actually higher on the picture plane. Maybe so it was, it was a violent. very different way of looking at things, and yeah. some, you know, the artists, the artists were really interested, and the the general public in in uh, say France, they had a hard time dealing with it. They they didn't adopt it right away. They didn't they didn't uh, they didn't think it was right. <laughs> so it was different than what they were used to. Well, it looked flat, you know, and, and we we kind of like paintings that look. You know, you can be impressionistic, but it still has depth, you know? But then when you look at Japanese art, it, it, it just has no depth whatsoever. And it, it, so they look like you can't tell which is closer, the tree or the mountain. They look like they're exactly in the same spot. Yeah. If you know yeah. what I mean? So it looks flat. Right. And, you know, yes, I, do. I don't, we don't look at things quite like that. Hmm. Well, it, what's and interesting to me on that is lighting, because it's as a as in photography, there are times with lighting. You know, I just took that photo the other day, Nancy, yeah. when we, I went on a morning walk, and there was a Fena pepla and a hummingbird hanging out together, and hmm. it was barely sunrise. I mean, and when does that happen? Because you know they're territorial, and they were facing each other, and it was um was it was Earth Day. It was like Earth Day, I think, or it was National Park Day week or it was starting something like that. Anyway, they looked like they were talking to each other. And <laughs> yet it was flat because of the lighting. Yeah, the lighting. And, and yet it just created this whole different atmosphere without it having the roundness because they were like little silhouettes in a tree. And right. everything, it was like black and blue. And it was neat. So to me, there is something about that style. It's just, it is like what you were talking about, but... There's a different quality to it. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Sometimes, you know, and, and little kids often will do this, um, where they will make the most important thing to them big, and yeah. everything else, you know, <laughs> you know, a person may be really big in their picture, whereas a 64-story yeah. building that they, that is in the picture too is tiny. So. Wow. So yeah. maybe it's in the distance, maybe it's not. It might just be not as important. So you, yeah, you, you when you're in a different, when you're when you're a stranger, going into a different culture or looking at something that was done in a different culture, uh, you have to be careful about how you interpret it and mm -hmm. what you think the artist was trying to do. Well, it was interesting mm -hmm. too of the content. You know, you talk about this as orient orientalizing. Um, it, because everyone's going more from the, the East and the Eastern mm -hmm. Orient, you know, we're going the Orient Express. We don't hear that word anymore. Right. We're going to the Orient. Um, <laughs> and when you think about that, it, and it touches in places like Morocco and Egypt and Turkey and all these just, you know, exotic, it's exotic, you know, you right. think of, it's just, it's spices and all of that was going on. But then not only are we looking at how, they they were creating and, and, and doing art in different ways, but also what they were, you know, their subject was different. Slave markets. I right. Mean, and then camels, that's cool. But there were actual, like, oh. battle scenes. Now, battle scenes have been portrayed through history here. But, you know, this is really interesting, that kind of art. Like, I, I never thought of battle art from way back when. But, yeah, that they, oh. they did. You know? Well... This, I I don't know. Um, I I find that that art of that period, the subject matter at least, um, being being so much different than what people were mm -hmm. used to. Like the sprints to slave markets. I mean, mm -hmm. England had, England had totally gotten rid of it, of any kind of slave activity by that time. And it was outlawed, totally outlawed, and yet. They enjoyed looking at those pictures, and um, they may it may be have been sort of semi pornographic, you know. Maybe that's why they they liked looking at them. But I think part of it is hmm. that 
they weren't doing it now. It was it was something that happened to them for them in the past. So there was a historical distance there, and also um, a cultural distance because of because of the time the time that had elapsed. It, it wasn't as um, it wasn't as in your face kind of kind of experience for them looking at looking at those pictures. And, and, a different, and it was in a different culture. It wasn't their culture. Um, mm-hmm. It was it was somebody else's culture. And so um, I think they maybe justified it <laughs> uh, that way. Hmm. It's, it's, it's interesting, yeah, because it's also still part of documenting history. We always talk about that, you know, how art is sharing what has well, gone on in the world. Especially before photography. Yeah, before photography, I mean, you had art. art. Where you're going to yeah, write something. Yeah. You know, it's so even the battle art that has to do with battles, it's, it's really interesting. Um, talk to Chip Beck. He's a combat artist and, and veteran. He's traveled the world. I mean, he's he's been everywhere. He's been he he his story is absolutely incredible, and he's in he's in a couple of our magazines. But just that whole idea of combat art, and mm. you know, hearing why they do it and and the stories that come from it, and it, that that it's still something. Even doing cartoons, you know, um, right? In that way, these caricatures and things. It's really interesting to see that kind of art come out of there. Like all the artists that do the artist in residence program with the mm-hmm. National Parks Arts Foundation at Gettysburg, and some of these historic battlefields that we have in this country. For them to take on that subject and how mm-hmm. they handle that subject. There was the one poet, she went out to Gettysburg and her whole thing was here were basically this um were Quaker community, Quaker families living there and they're against battle and they're into peace and now suddenly they're in the middle of the Civil War. They're in the middle of right. Gettysburg. And how did right. their feelings and their ha- how did they handle that? So apparently art really helps tell the story mm-hmm. but also so people don't forget these things you know the you, you know right. it's how it's displayed right. i don't want to get into everything about statues now but <laughs> you know um it's just to me very it is an interesting time because i think at that point art has always been the way of documenting and and standing up to say that's this true happened. yeah that's true no matter what culture and mm-hmm. and to really you know i'm sure that that people who who are drawing on history are also doing some research. You know, you know they they they're getting a feel. They're reading things. They've heard things. They they um, bring other other uh, material into their subject, whether it's poetry or or writing of another kind or or mm-hmm. or visual art mm-hmm. or documentaries. I mean, they they. If you if you if you didn't experience it yourself and you're you're talking about it, you've got you have to get some background on what what you're doing. And that, that's one thing that those people that in the 19th century did that were like doing the slave markets or the the harem scenes and so forth. You know, they in at the time they were painting, uh, they they couldn't go into the harem and paint. They had to rely on what people had told them and had described to them. Because harems were off limits <laughs> to to uh, anybody but but the man who owned owned the uh, concubines or or uh, the slave market may may even have been off limits to westerners. I'm not sure about that, but they had to rely on first person accounts. Mhm. So I mean, basically, when you um, you're doing something artistic. It's, you're you're trying to make a comment mm-hmm. in some way, in a creative way, right. about a yeah. subject, and and you know, and it's up to the the person looking at the painting or the sculpture, whatever, or listening to a poem. For them, you know, they will interpret it their mm-hmm. own way. You know, so right. an object of art is something that um, makes you think. It makes you think. And that's what most artists want. They want you to mm-hmm. to understand a concept or, you know, gain a feeling from a painting, something like that. You know, it's not just, it's not meant to be just a pretty picture, put it on your wall kind right. of thing. It's, it's a comment, right. you know. And so when you look at 
paintings of slave, you know, slave trade stuff. That's or harem. Is, yeah, or harem or something. That artist is making a comment. Now, you, you, you might not like their comment, or you <laughs> might misinterpret their comment. Or maybe you want maybe, the comment. Maybe, maybe the you... idea, like, I know, you know, we're talking a little bit about statues being taken down because statues give that, oh, we're honoring. Mm. Whereas a painting, you're not necessarily honoring the subject. You might be, you might not be, but the person <laughs> doesn't have to look at it. And you don't have to buy it or hang it on your walls or go see an exhibit if you don't like the subject. However, right. when a statue is put somewhere in the city squares, everybody has to see it whether they want to or not. <laughs> yeah. But, well, so you know, when, when people when people write a book and they're writing a book about something, some terrible thing that happened, or they're writing a book uh, about a subject that an, an individual, you know, really can't stand, but they, but, but sometimes the individual will read it because they'll say it was so beautifully written. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't like, I didn't like the topic, but boy, that yeah. guy could write or that mm -hmm. woman could write. And mm -hmm. it's a, sort of the same way with visual art. You know, it's how is it painted? You know, wh what, you know, is it, is it a masterpiece, no matter what the subject is, or is it is it is it a, 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 a pretty picture, but it's really really poorly painted? You know, it can go mm -hmm. either way. Um, mm -hmm. So I think a lot of times people respond. Um, people who are really into art will respond to the quality of the work mm -hmm. uh, itself, not necessarily the subject matter. Hmm. Exactly. This, it, mm -hmm. this is interesting. Like this, abstract art, you know. Yeah. That's really weird and wonderful, mm -hmm. and sometimes mm -hmm. it's just weird. <laughs> yeah, it, right. Up to everybody. Yeah, well, exactly. then you can say that about music or plays and movies. Yeah. You know? Exactly. You know, you can see. You but know, the, the justification for for uh, some uh, a work of, of art that's, that you know a group of people will say, oh, that's just pornography, and and then other people will say, yeah, but look, but it's so beautifully written, and and or you know, mm -hmm. it, it's. It's it's there. It's a justification for it, you know, mm. the way it was done. Mm. When when you go from country to country, and when people started traveling, they had to be really, you know, sometimes shocked at what they saw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, I know when the the explorers were, was the, the first time they went to a country where people weren't clothed the same as their country, it was shocking to them, and then sure. we had to go get people to take them to God, you know, and get them dressed. Yeah. Cut all their hair. That, yeah, cut their hair and do all these things. You know, it's like, whoa, look at that. Yeah. We can't be having that. <laughs> yeah. So it it's interesting when somebody goes like, um, when I look at this country, how we decorate our homes, like we don't have this this bright color in every single room, like we've lived in two houses, one in Mexico and one in South Africa, where every single room was a different color. And mm -hmm. I'm not talking pastels, I'm talking blue like, was hello, blue, we are. and <laughs> yellow was right. really yellow, and yeah. red was way red. It's emotional walking through. Yeah, and it was on the inside and the outside. And so it's like, you know, you were like, whoa, this is crazy. We don't do that so much in this country. Now, Mexico, has colors are a little bit lighter yeah, colors, but it's but still it's vibrant. It's colorful. It's colorful, and and they have, you know, brick walls and tiles and all that. We might incorporate a little bit of Mexican tile in the kitchen or the bathroom, but yeah. we're not doing the wall thing. We're not. And so when you go from country to country as an artist, you might have been, oh, I'm I'm doing watercolors and pastels, and let me keep it a little this way, that way. Then you go to Mexico and you go, man, let's go for the color. Let's splash that mm -hmm. red on there. <laughs> right, yeah. right. You know, I, I, I have um, had experiences in my life that have made me change my my opinion back and forth um, mm -hmm. about, about color. Um, but hmm. basically, you know, Good design is good design, whether in and color and how you use color and how you uh, how you uh, put shapes together and stuff. And so I I I don't get I, I I just find it all interesting, you know. It just it it you know I I appreciate every culture because every mm -hmm. culture has something wonderful, 
And yeah. they, every culture probably has people who aren't great also, <laughs> but they have people yeah. who are great and, and, and uh, who use that culture's, um, what I'm going to try to say, but they, they have, every culture has kind of a personality and they use the things in that, in that culture's personality in a way that transcends the culture even because mm-hmm. people from everywhere can, can appreciate it. Or people, yeah. you know, you you look at that's why we can appreciate things from art way in the past and art from different cultures is because mm. it's what has been handed down to us um, mm-hmm. has been so well done. And we have an, our our basic way of organization in art is something that's ingrained in our, in us. Some some to a uh, higher pitch than others, but it that that part of our um, personality, our, our psyche, our, um, mm-hmm. our way of organization helps us understand other cultures, whether they're, I, I whether they're cur- yeah, current that, or, that, or way in the past. It, that's the thing. That's what art does. It bridges the gaps. And yeah, it does. About, it bridges everything. It, yeah. It, it, yep. make, it makes you, it, it's pattern interrupt. It's jump out of your comfort zone and it's in front of you. Like deal with yep. it now. You know, it's here and it's going to, it's going to give you all kinds of experiences. I find any, anything that comes from a cultural perspective, that's just like, this is part of my roots, my art of my, my, you know, like it's connected with your roots of who you are. And, you know, may, you know, because we've talked on, on so many, this, this, this whole article, everyone, you've got to go check it out at nationalparktraveling.com is really, it, it's kind of like a culmination of, our conversations over the years, you know, I think in this, in this interesting <laughs> way of how like even petroglyphs and, and things like that, rock art and mess right. come into this, mm-hmm. but it teaches us about cultures, but it also opens this door to creativity. So things like this for me, like to look at all the photos that go with this, all the photos of the art. And to, I mean, it, it just makes me want to create things and look at shift perspective Try something new and different, just as any, no matter what kind of creativity is, you look at these paintings or the masks and, you know, all of the different ways, the wood, the, all of it makes you go like, do something different. Why are we still doing the same way? Maybe you were, you know, <laughs> that's the thing. Go take the yeah. other road, man. I wanted to touch on Gauguin because we're going to play Wally Lauder's song Gauguin at the end of this okay. conversation. Okay. But, but it's interesting because, I mean, when you start thinking about Tahiti, like how that influenced him and, you mm-hmm. know, just like the color. Yeah, it goes back to that. Mm-hmm. And how, I don't know, sometimes I feel like we're, we've become, yes, a global society with the Internet and, and whatever is going on in corporate stuff and stocks and bonds and all whatever, that stuff. But sometimes I actually feel in a way that this has got, I don't know, it makes me feel like, you know, it's like National Geographic, you know, there's, there's this, um, I don't know, more like a, an interesting connection looking at the masters and how they changed and how they've brought these countries to light and, or the styles or the techniques compared to sometimes that we have everything at the fingertips now. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, Gauguin, um, he was an interesting guy. Um, when he went to he went to Tahiti, he he um, spent a lot of years there, and he 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 um, had, had kind of a common law um, relationship with uh, a, a woman there. He said he was there for many many years, and um, he he his paintings embody the religious and cultural mm. principles of, the, of Tahiti at, at that time. Uh, he, he he was, I think, um, he he was introspective. I believe he, his paintings, although they have Tahitian subjects, a lot mostly women, a lot of pattern in them, um, a, a lot of sculpture that he's painting with uh, p- pictures of sculpture that he's painted of, of the gods and so forth that that were worshipped in Tahiti at the time. Um, hmm. I find his paintings to be kind of silent, and um, that he more that he more that he was an observer 
a really strong observer than he was a participant in their in their culture. And even though he was he 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 you know was absorbed into the, into the community that he lived in. Um, mm. That's that may be totally false. It was it's my my perspective, mm. I guess, on, on when I look at his work. Mm. Um, he went back to 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 France to Brittany, and he also did did paintings there. Um, where he, he he it's like he sense he senses the spiritual in a lot of things and i don't by mm-hmm. spiritual i don't yes. necessarily mean good i mean he he senses the i think he senses the good and he senses the evil and it comes mm-hmm. out in his paintings whatever you know in his subject matter in various it's, ways it's, but yeah um, i agree with you about the silence part i think he makes you think i think it really makes you think and feel and just kind of he gives you that room. He it's, gives you that yeah. room. It's, it's interesting because if you look at different forms of art, like if you look at music that's instrumental, it's vastly different mm-hmm. than music that's being sung and has lyrics that you can actually understand. So the the musician and the singer is telling you something mm-hmm. and commenting on something. The instrumental is more like a, a painting because it's, it you have to figure it out for yourself, you know, mm-hmm. with art. It's like, <laughs> reading yeah. the book, they're telling you something, and they're telling it to you in a particular way to get their point across. And right. When but when you're looking at a painting, you're kind of on your own, man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you're right, and I. That's probably why um, some other creative me um, endeavors are more popular because. Mm-hmm. Visual art re- does require some work on the part of yeah. the viewer, and uh, and so, just like some books require work, and sometimes you you go through you you know go a chapter and then you have to go back back to the beginning mm-hmm. to to pick yep. up something. So you you know you it it isn't an easy read, and sometimes paintings mm-hmm. aren't easy reads either, and mm-hmm. um, so it 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 affects the artist you know uh, popularity sort of if. Um, if because most people are looking for are looking for an easy something easy on the eyes and something they don't have to think too much about. And that doesn't sound like I, I respect the viewer very much, although I really do respect the viewer viewers. Um mm-hmm. and I appreciate viewers. But um hmm. and, and of course some artwork can be can be seen like uh, on different levels, just like just like uh, literature can be seen on different levels, mm-hmm. or or read on different levels. So um, in, you don't you know what to, you don't have to you don't have to understand everything about a painting to to enjoy it or connect with no, it. Yeah, I think it changes. Yeah. the viewpoint mm-hmm. changes over time about yeah um, art and and even different books. I used to, in English literature, I really, really didn't like the professor because it was always this is what so and so means, and I would read it and I'm like, well, actually, I think that's not what they mean. And yeah. it's like, no, yeah. this is it. This is the lesson. This is what they mean. <laughs> Take it or leave Put this it. down yeah. on your test. <laughs> this is it. Yeah. So you're not going to pass. This is what it yeah. means. If I, right. I don't think you're right. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> because, but, no. Know, then I think the person who wrote the book did a good job because there's the conversation. Do you agree or do you not? You know, and so it's funny when it comes into the creative arts and schooling, there are the fundamental rules of art. Do you follow them? Mm-hmm. You should know them. And if you break them, it should be on purpose, <laughs> not because you didn't know them. Yeah. You know, you should have a rationale for breaking them. Yeah. You know? And so yeah. it's interesting when you come to paintings, it's, it's really interesting because, I mean, um, there's to me, there's a difference between a picture and a painting. A picture, you buy the right colors to match your sofa. That's a picture. Yeah. A painting is something you think Connect about. Connect with. Even a, a, even a, a photo, right? When yeah. you're talking yeah. about the, the, the flat yeah. versus yeah. like yeah. painting, like to me, yeah. a painting sometimes the texture mm-hmm. runs with emotion. So like you could tell if like the artist, you know, they're pissed and they take their palette knife and they just slap it on there. <laughs> like you can feel the emotion of the artist. Like, look at that, you know, 
So I think that there's right. two things. There's emotional connection too. You know, there's, oh, did they try to say this, blah, 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 but there's this connection. And I think, some, like when you're saying you don't have to understand everything, you could look at a painting, no. um, you know, and not realize the era, not know who, what, where, but you have an right. incredible connection with it mm -hmm. for some reason. And, and it'll, over the years, you'll figure it out, which is cool. Mm -hmm. But I think this, this and, is and you know, as, as 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 time goes on, you have other experiences. So you come back to that painting, you know, three years mm -hmm. after you saw it the first time, and you're seeing it. You're seeing it really again for the first time because mm -hmm. because things have happened in your life. Now you're gonna you will you will have more experience that you mm -hmm. might draw on to appreciate it in a different way. Mm. Exactly, and knowing something about the artist helps. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you know, because then you could interpret a painting away in a particular way, and then you go read a book on, about the artist, and you're like, "Wow, that's really <laughs> different than what I." Think. Okay, well let's go. Let's go to you know Picasso. Apparently, oh okay, so we went from harems and 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 all of that to now French prostitutes. We, this we, is a typical conversation with us. <laughs> I mean, we we're all over the place. I know. I'm 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 moving back to the artist. But it, well, no, but this is that's art, man. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's what makes it so yes, it's, it, this is it. It's it's called it's jazz hour with Victoria and Nancy yeah. and Lisa because we get to chat wherever we want because <laughs> yeah. we're adults. <laughs> so so yeah, when you look at Picasso. So today, boys and girls, we're I know. talking about <laughs> French prostitutes. <laughs> but no, but he was a guy who's, you know, he's bringing in masks, but he wasn't necessarily making masks. So you, you, he's taking like a, a, a vibe of something, like you know, and, and incorporating it, not necessarily going. They make masks now. I'm going to make masks too. You know. Right. Well, you know, there. The cause is interesting. Basically, he's a 20th century guy, but he was borrowing. He was he was borrowing. From the from the his his sources for the African masks that were being brought into France at the time, and he was he was of course painting he was Spanish but he was painting in France, and uh, <laughs> the artists loved Japanese stuff they loved uh, African stuff. Um, I think by the also during that century the 19th century Freud. Uh, was big, and he, the idea of, and and Jung was coming in. So the idea mm -hmm. of a mask, uh, here we go, <laughs> yeah. was um, <laughs> something that that he he might have been thinking about. I don't know, but um, but he was he was definitely using it as a design element, an angularity of it. And he changed the bodies to be as angular as. Um, as a mask, and he got in. He they hated his stuff. I mean, why was his stuff any worse than the slave market or the nude people in the harem, you know, in the 19th century? But it was because it was in your face. It was it was too contemporary, and so people were outraged over the demoiselles Yamignon, whereas with the, they were perfectly fine with Jerome painting uh, uh, the harem. With nude, nude women in it. This is interesting because also that's now that's another role of art is to push people again, like we were saying about outside your comfort zone. Yeah, this, yeah, and, it's, and, and later, it's, it shows how it shows how culturally bound we are. Mm -hmm. Wow, bound is a good word, isn't it? That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, because it's like, hey, they do this. Get over it. Like, <laughs> just look at so it. Anyway, like, but oh, and now, now yeah. time has passed. We've we've a hundred years has passed almost since he did yeah. that. We and now we think it's wonderful. So and now we have <laughs> real pornography. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who needs Picasso? You know. So. And it's moving. It got, like actually, and the whole sex trade with it. So nothing's really changed in that uh, way. Let me no, see. nothing. Nothing ever changes. I mean, we are. We are. We are not as enlightened as we think we are. I so. <laughs> Freud was right. It's all about sex. Just get over it. It is. It is. <laughs> oh boy, this oh. this is a this is one for the books for sure. <laughs> so let's let's go back to uh, <laughs> let me pick it up. back here. to the to the nineteenth century now. <laughs> I know. Let's not go. Well, you know, it is all cyclical. Everything goes in cycles. This you is know what yeah. happens when you travel. Okay. So we've got Gauguin. We've done him. Okay. <laughs> 
Picasso's got his his prostitute yeah. in there. Okay, we've covered, so now, we've covered them. What about Monet? We got to talk about him and his flowers because that to me is interesting because you know some of his work was did he he didn't we cover him also as being a plein air artist or am I wrong? I got somebody else in my head. No, he he we didn't do him. He was a studio artist. He wasn't okay. plein air plein air painter. Even though he was inspired greatly by his his garden and other things, um, he he really wasn't wasn't plein air. Um, but he was an impressionist, so um, or a post impressionist. So, what what was the question? <laughs> um, well, I want to talk about him because he was he was also into what was going on with the wood with the wood blocks from you know the Japanese wood blocks and their 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 work. And so he got in. Do you think they actually got him into painting flowers, or was he playing, painting flowers beforehand? I think. He was very influenced by Japanese art. Period. But he okay. he would buy Japanese costumes. He loved he loved the pattern. Uh, he he sometimes he even dressed dressed in Japanese outfits. But he, but he like a lot of the artists in in the 19th century in in around Paris, they were um, really in love with Japanese art. Some of them collected the prints. He collected costumes. He collected. Uh, Dishes. He collected anything Japanese. He collected it, and his garden was his essentially his version of a Japanese garden. Mm. I mean, I don't think I don't think he had ever visited a, a Japanese garden, but he had seen photos and stuff. So was the, that bridge, that arched bridge in his in his mm. garden, is based mm. on, a, on a Japanese um, yeah. prototype. Okay. Um, That's, so he, and, he was a cultural cross dresser. <laughs> Oh, that's the way. <laughs> yeah, cross cultural cross dresser. Yes, he was. Okay, cross cultural. <laughs> so, you know, hey, um, you know, yeah, he, would, he would he would he would have his yeah his wife he would have her dressed in kimonos and he would put wigs on her and stuff. I mean, it was a it was like oh, a uh, wow. It was like a party, like a, like he was immersing himself in in the in a culture. No, I think that's cool. Because when you travel, yeah. when you travel and you, like, if you wear a kimono, for example, right, you're going <laughs> to yeah. understand what that feels like. If you're, if you go to Holland, put some clogs on and try and walk a mile and see what happens right. to your feet. Right. You know, there's something about clothing that it, it, I know we've talked about this before, that, but yeah. layer to, the world. to me, like, I, like if I came back in a different, you know, in a different land and different world, yeah. I would come back as a textile designer because I find it <laughs> that it comes from that's why I, I, I love this article and this conversation too because the reason why is from the designs that I've grown up in you know was raised in um, the in Africa's uh, the design work that would come from that right because there were so many cultures put together mm -hmm. there was Indian and you know then a lot of people took that and said okay we're hippie with that but no, there, before that, it wasn't hippie. This is just like how the circles moved and the everything kind of had this flowing fit to it. And the designs, just some clothing and, and patterns. I always find that fascinating. Then in the Dutch East India um, company with their pattern, their design work, which to me is really fascinating because it ended up on clothing, that kind of pattern on right. textiles, even if it's, you know, uh, curtains or something for your it's, you know it's interesting the I, difference. I would do I would do that in a heartbeat. I would be a textile <laughs> designer just to incorporate all these different cultures through patterns. It and it's why it's so cool. And that's something yeah. that I think they were doing like what I'm but I would like want to do. Well it, but Mexico, don't know how to do Mexico colors and art is so similar to uh, some parts of Africa. Not all, but some. Hmm. There's the the mm -hmm. patterns, um, especially like you know there's the. But don't forget there was Afro Mexicans, right? Afro Latinas, yeah, too. And so there, that's right. the connection. That's true too. Yeah. Right. So it and that was came from slavery days, right? So, and and then the, and that's the Spaniards who did that. And it was but right. That. The typical European art seems more pointed and and refined it's not really the word i'm looking for but when you look at the porcelain mm -hmm. art that you're talking about and you look at mexican art vastly different 
Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Like, okay, with the porcelain, we're only going to use this blue, blue and, and white. white. That's, That's it. it. <laughs> and and we're going to be realistic. We're not making... That's called branding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You remind me of that painting that made me so angry. This, oh, we're back this, to that painting. Yeah, the painting there in England, this gallery I wanted to put my work in, and they decided wildlife art, in, unless you were David Shepard, you're out. And wildlife yeah. art had to be in a wildlife art gallery. Couldn't be in a gallery because wildlife art is not art. That really made me angry. But oh yeah, <laughs> they had in their in this very refined upscale snobby art gallery, a painting called My Corner of the Sahara Desert, oh, yeah. and it was just yellow, and it was selling for 2,500 pounds, and that was years ago, and I'm like, dude, if that's what you want, I'll just bring you my corner of the ocean, here's your blue block. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, well, oh, gallery, yeah. gallery stuff is, you, that's can, never, you can never judge by galleries. Mm-mm. Yeah, you, that's all. That that's a topic. <laughs> that because ga- gallery, topic. Ga- galleries are. <laughs> it's a very yeah. it's a very tenuous business, and they yeah. they think they have it. They have a niche that they try to fill. They they think mm. or they they'll get an artist and his work will really sell, and they don't want him to change because they're they're marketing his style or they they or artists like him. They think well, I've got to get more artists like this because this is a you know hot stuff. And so, and so they're not interested in your subject matter or your way of doing it because it doesn't fit in their niche. They, they know their customer base. And so, you, you know, you, when you, and you can usually tell when you go into gallery whether your work is, gonna, is going to yeah. um, be compatible with what they're looking for or not. So. But that's interesting because it goes back to branding. Because artists, <laughs> yeah. musicians, right? And we talk to just about every musician we interview, unless they're like, we are pure blues, pure jazz, pure mm-hmm. bluegrass, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, you, they, you, they wind up, want to be, you wind up self-labeling yourself. Yeah, you, but they don't want to be in any genre necessarily. They just want the music to come out how the music comes out. Then the marketing yeah. people come in and go, you will do it this way. And, you know, for distribution, <laughs> you you need to put, you know, you need yeah. to be in the little box. And it's yeah. interesting with art. That's something I wanted to ask is because, you know, branding has been around. I mean, even look at the blacksmith shops. You go in there and you'll find brands on walls and stuff. And that was a form of mm-hmm. communication back in the day, too, especially in, in slave trade. Um, and, and communities that they could talk, and, and sometimes it was through that. It was a different for it's like pictographs, and there's it's a form of communication. But when you look at actual marketing, branding, and all of that, an artist starts to change with new discoveries, right? Which I find thrilling, exciting. Right. Musicians come up yeah. with a new album, you're like, now we have to sell, get people to actually listen to something new. Yeah. Well, I want to. Most of us love it. Yeah. There's that. I do. You mean you guys may in you guys in music may notice it more than than visual artists because okay um, because people you know people you know everybody your 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 album goes or or not your album but your your CD goes you know platinum or something and now your your uh, record producer your your whatever you call it doesn't want you to change. Because yeah. he's making money, you're making money. You should be happy. Why do you want to change? So, so it's very hard to grow um, mm-hmm. when you're in in that position. Mm-hmm. You have to, you probably have to really fight if you really feel strongly about doing something different. You really have to to fight to get it done. These yeah. artists, though, like Monet. Um, look at him. He was famous for like the water lilies, right? And he's, you know, right. they get known for something, but a lot of times it's not necessarily when they're doing it. Um, right. You know, when you think back, but if they created some kind of following, I mean, did if they did something new, do you think back then that they were, people were more open to change? I mean, obviously, yeah, when, you know, we go back to the, the French nudies or you know, French <laughs> prostitutes, they were, but you know what I mean? Yeah. So there's that change that has to come with I've got some new right. techniques. You're excited. Um, your, your, you know, your passion for that piece of art is there as an artist, and then you put it out to the world. And I'm like, well, how come you want painting? Well, you know, a lot of times the world doesn't know what it wants. 
Um, that's artists, t- artists that are, are sensitive generally to their surroundings and their, their milieu. And they will sense change before a lot of people are aware of it. And so, you know, other people might be, it might be 10 years or 15 years before people, you know, get it. And, and it, you know, it happens, it happens slowly. The changes happen slowly. The attitude of a, of a, of a community or the attitude of a nation has changed over a period of time. And, the, and the artist picks it up at the beginning that this is happening and people, most people resist change. Yeah, they do. Mm-hmm. And we're, we, we, that's, a, that's kind of a, a fault of, of most of us or, or a characteristic of most of us that we, we like things, we like the status quo. And yeah. so, um, I think, I think artists who are really sensitive, um, are in the forefront of change and it takes a while for people to catch up. Hmm. That's the point. It, I think it's, of art. you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I don't think the art world um, is exactly the same as the music world. Like it, in the mm-hmm. music world, um, if you are Elvis Presley, shake it. You, no, at a certain <laughs> point in his career, it didn't matter what he's saying. It's yes. going out there and people are going to buy it mm-hmm. because yeah. it was him. Now in the art world, they, <laughs> the king. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. The Albus is yeah, the king. But, yeah, so, yeah. Well, you're right. Know, you're right. Um, but, there are personalities right. like oh. that. Yeah. yeah. What, okay. What about Andy Warhol? And and yeah, but then the, uh, that's usually after the artist is dead. Yeah. And everybody's looking back yeah. and appreciating yeah. the art for the whole of the person's life and everything they did then the paintings become that valuable but when right. you're you know it's yeah. it's different somehow yeah. it's a, this like is... there's certain people who write books that um if you know wilbur smith james michener those are my favorite historic novels mm. i will read any book written by those guys because i know it's going to be good whether i like the yeah. country or the the period of time they're writing about I will still read it because I know it's going to be good and I'll learn stuff and enjoy it. So authors seem to get there at some point, but it, it's, it's painters don't seem to get there that often. It's well, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's hard, man. It's yeah. a hard world. And and like you say, navigating <laughs> galleries and things like that, it's hard. The yeah. world of art is not easy and mm-hmm. yeah, you get that lucky break that's great but i look at it there's just art everywhere and and we got to all look at it you know and discover new yeah. things about ourselves through it i want to go to america though um okay america okay so america coming in i mean not american but european artists coming in here and things started we back to our other discussion of americans getting into or artists getting into the american southwest and the west so that became another form of travel was bringing people here. Okay. And, and that's an interesting part of it, you know. Well, it is. And there were a lot of 19th century American artists who went to Paris to study because Paris, you know, you know the, uh, for a long time, Rome was considered the, the, the center of the art world. And that all shifted to Paris in the 19th century. And that's where everybody went who wanted to study. Mm-hmm. Um a lot of American artists went there, and so they they heard about when they went to the, the, the Academy Julian was the main place they started out studying, and and that was a uh, a, a hotbed of really great great up and coming artists. But they heard about Santa Fe, and by that time uh, time uh, across you know intercontinental. Railroads were in existence, and so in the late um, 18, 19th century, a lot of European artists came to the United States. Also, a lot of East Coast artists came to the West, <clears throat> and uh, because they, view, you know, they they viewed it as exotic. They they thought the West was as exotic as you know as somebody from France going to Turkey. It was mm. it was new and different, and there was a, there were other cultures there. Um, yeah. Things the, 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 the landscape was totally different. The light mm. was totally different. So uh, it was a big attraction. 
and uh, a lot of artists, a lot of artists came, a lot of artists stayed in in that New Mexico uh, area. Hmm. Amazing. Some of them, and some of them, yeah. you know, and of course, New Mexico right now isn't even a very populous state. And back then, it was certainly not very populous, especially with people who would buy art. So even though they were producing a lot of art there, a, a lot of them had to send their work back to be sold on the East Coast, where there wow, were so the money. Then you're hoping the gallery, yeah, yeah the gallery person there. You know, yeah, say, yeah. Goes with my there were no, there were no galleries. You know, Santa Fe is like that, that area, Santa Fe and uh, Taos. That is like the second biggest art market in the United States right now. But at that, at the time that these that these artists were there, there were no art galleries. In fact, there weren't any art galleries there until about 1950. So, wow. uh, if you wanted to earn your living as an artist. Um, doing this exotic subject matter, you had to you had to go where there's a bigger market at that time. So I went to the East Coast. Wow, it's, it's really interesting, you know, because then I wonder about like, okay, you've got these the galleries, but the formation of cooperative galleries where artists work together, and I think that's uh-huh. how we all connected with you years ago. Was yeah. That kind of um, thing. Well, at that time, they at that time they didn't have cooperative galleries, but they did have cooperative groups of artists, mm-hmm. and they would help each other, and they would they would kind of mount a an you know an exhibit. They would sort of critique their each other's work and decide there was enough good work, and they would they would to contact the gallery on the East Coast, and then they would ship their work there. So there was cooperation, but not mm. um, not galleries um, mm. here in, in New Mexico at that time. Oh, because they, there were no customers <laughs> to speak yeah. of. Right, you know, but I think this mm. is interesting how the cooperatives started, and then how, yes. you know, you have associations now, and then you have mm-hmm. the cooperative galleries now. Yeah. So it, it right. seems like this kind of thing, and, and it, it includes education. Um, you know, I know that like in Austin, Texas, on the music side, they even have it where they have a fund for musicians who get sick. So musicians, yes. I mean, there's all these interesting things that happen where everyone goes, okay, if we're going to be doing this different stuff that's going to make people think and sometimes react in other ways, we better stick together, yeah. man. we got to be our own army. So. <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's enlightened self-interest. and. Uh, and and when you're helping somebody else, you're usually you're helping yourself too, uh, one way or another. But uh, mm. there are a lot of artist groups, uh, visual artist groups too, that do the same thing, where they they'll have a fund, and if somebody you know has some you know medical issue or you know and there's no no health insurance, because you know artists tend to be an independent lot. Uh, mm. Musicians have unions, artists don't, and um, so they 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 help each other. It's on a small scale, and it's a personal. It's kind of a personal scale too, where where if somebody gets into trouble and they can you know buy their groceries for a few weeks, they will they will chip in and do that. That's amazing. That's really cool. Well, there it is, everybody. A yeah. hundred years of art around the world in one hour. <laughs> <laughs> and we and we ended up broke and destitute. I know. That's it. And everybody, I'm gonna it's go. Good thing you got friends. I'm gonna go eat some ramen noodles now. Like, what do you call those things? That you, don't eat them. Don't get those. Things. Oh. You know what I'm, don't eat that stuff. Oh. Like, that's plastic or whatever. It's, don't eat the plastic well, I, thing. I I always I always enjoy getting into this with you guys because we do cover a lot of ground and yeah. um, I I find I always like your opinions and um, I like it, you know it's fun to exchange ideas exactly that's yeah. what art's about and so you're yeah. always teaching us so thank you for that because <laughs> there's a, you know we do interviews we'll be talking to someone else I'm like well you know I what's, I can't even remember what interview just the other day we were talking about well Victoria says this yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No, no, no. It's like I back it up. They, they go read your article on it. Um, but you know, that's the thing to me. It's about, you know, it is about opinions, and we need to have an opinion. I know that there's quotes out there about everyone has one, just like something else we have. But if we don't formulate this kind of thing in our mind, opinions, you can change it. You can always change, yeah. and and art is the constituent of change. And you know, if you don't have an opinion, then you probably have an education. You're a robot, though. Yeah. 
that's <laughs> it. You're not thinking. Yeah, that's it. You're a robot, and you can go work for Elon Musk, and you can go fly up in a little thing. I say, I, I, I would wish, if I had a wish for everybody, it was that they would have an independent, uh, an independent opinion and a sense of humor. <laughs> because yeah. we, that's some. So then I can say, sometimes we get, that we, we get so, we get so in love with our opinions, we, we don't want to listen to anything else, and, and you, yeah, you really, it. you have to have. Uh, some ability yeah. to laugh at yourself <laughs> and 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 have a perspective on on whatever everyone thinks. So exactly, that's my I opinion. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. That's how we can get <laughs> politics moving forward. Okay, we won't start on that. <laughs> but independent thought is good, and that's what art is about. It's about taking a yep. stand on it. And you, if you, I remember, you know, the eight keys of excellence with you, Victoria. Um, you know, talking about that in the very first key of excellence is integrity. And you took that and you're like, if you don't have integrity in art and you don't paint what you want to paint, you're not, you're not an artist. <laughs> like it was yeah. something that, yeah. you know, yeah. straight up. I was like, well, you have no more to explain on that. She's like, well, no, paint what you, <laughs> paint what you want to paint. That's it. You know, don't tell let somebody else dictate your art. You know? right. And that's the thing that there's integrity to art. And, uh, and I think that's really what's so exciting about these conversations and your articles. Right. Everyone, again, uh, you can go to nationalparktraveling.com now and type in Victoria. You'll find her articles there. Or go to blendradioandtv.com. You'll see her in our expert department there. Uh, the article will also be featured in the June and July issue of Parks and Travel Magazine. But, of course, go to Victoria's website. It is victoriachick.com. And now wait for it. It's time to play Go Gan. Get those Tahitians out there. Get your Tahitian paintings and shake and shake. <laughs> so this this song is from Wally Lauder, who is based here in Tucson, Arizona, but also used to live in Silver City. So that's our connection with Nancy and I being here in Tucson and Victoria being in Silver City. And um, he's based here in Tucson. Go to WallyLauder.com. Don't forget, Big Blend Radio airs Monday through Thursday from 4 p.m. Pacific time, 7 p.m. Eastern time, as well as Fridays and Sundays at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. You can go to BigBlendRadio.com and you'll see the schedule of upcoming shows and also on-demand episodes. Thanks so much for joining us, Victoria. I enjoyed it. I'll see you next or hear you next month, I guess. Yeah, so. next month. Yeah, cool. we'll chat <laughs> next month. Here it is, everybody. Go Gan. There's a ship on the open sea And it's sailing for Tahiti On board is a man Go again, go again, go again He likes colors expressive Everything changes perspective And he's leaving behind his land Go again, go again, go again Feel your death calm que je veux naviguer avec vous Beaucoup de fois j'ai demandé pareil What are we? Where are we going? His wife in Paris wore an evening dress, layers and ruffles so fair, a cup of china in her hand, an early canvas by Gauguin. Tahitians lay naked on the beach Jet black is their hair Women with mangoes in their hands Go again, go again, go again There are times I want to sail with you Many times I've asked the same things Il y a des temps que je veux naviguer avec vous 
que de fois j'ai demandé pareil Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? There's a ship on the open sea 